You're supposed oh to my god, I did. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to do that. There you go. <laughs> well, um, yeah, just uh, uh, give us a, a few minutes as uh, thank you for joining. Uh, just give us a few minutes as uh, everybody uh, uh, joins right now. We have a lot of people uh, coming on on uh, online, so we uh, uh, clicked. We got it uh, started uh, just a couple minutes early, so uh, we'll we'll just wait a few more minutes. All right, thank you. great we still have uh, a lot of people joining uh good morning thank you we're gonna just wait a few more minutes before we get the program started thank you Again, thank you for everybody that's just joining. Uh, we're, there's a lot of people coming online, so we're just going to wait a few more minutes before we get the program kicked off. Looks like we hit 11.30, so we are going to get our, our part two kicked off. Again, welcome uh, to part two of Moving Beyond Recovery. Um, we're really going to be looking at you know, some opportunities, um, 
and risks, obviously, but moving beyond recovery to new growth. I'm really excited uh, today uh, to join us in our interactive discussion with our panel members. We're going to talk about a lot of different topics. So it's going to be a fun interactive session uh, with about re reshoring, value added services, advanced manufacturing, innovative paths, and also the skills pipeline. I'm Thomas Solange. I'm the firm's manu national manufacturing leader. And again, I want to welcome you to our part two. Before we get kicked off, I do want to mention that we still have uh, our upcoming sessions. Part three is this Friday. Uh, again, very interactive panel discussion around supply chain. I mean, we can talk about the pandemic and what COVID has really done to the supply chain. And our uh, Atlanta-based team, our advisory team, is, will, led by Cindy Hanafi, exciting discussion around what does it look like, you know, under a, a Biden win, what happens under a Trump win? Um, such there's a large amount going, so much going on with supply chain, from digital transformation to speed to market. So really excited panel discussion. And then on next Thursday will be our financial, uh, really strategies. What does it take to take a business to the next level from a sustainability and really accelerate growth? When we think about um, looking at, you know, do we lean back in a time like this or do we lean forward and take advantage of opportunities? What do you have to do to do that? So some great upcoming discussions, but today I really want to get kicked off a little bit. I'm going to introduce the, our speakers and then I'm going to let Thomas Stewart take over and moderate the session. Uh, so first, yeah, I want to introduce uh, Thomas Stewart. He's our senior academic and publishing and marketing executive. He led our discussion uh, on our part one. Really excited to have him back to lead our, our panel. Um, I'll let, you know, we'll go through uh, as I introduce everybody. And then also, if you can give me a little insight about, um, you know, really what do you see that's most promising as far as opportunities and most important of how to manage risk? Um, Doug, I'll, you know, I'm Doug Lalone uh, is a patent attorney and partner at our firm. He serves as the chair of the firm's strategic IT practice group. Uh, Doug, I'll, I'll let you answer that first question. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Thomas, and uh, uh, great uh, being here today. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody about this uh, great topic about moving beyond recovery to the new growth. There are, um, as Tom indicated, I'm a patent attorney with Fishman Stewart in Troy, Michigan, and uh, we, we're an IP boutique patent firm. We focus on moving the needle on intellectual property uh, tasks. Um, let me, I just want to uh, put out five topics of opportunities that we see in the technology space. And I'm just going to give one example on one of these buckets, but pharma, there's great reshoring opportunities. Software, there's a massive amount of technology being built on this platform right here. We're seeing it constantly with new and existing customers uh, developing new platforms. Outer space and defense, I'm going to come back to that in a minute and give you an example where we're seeing growth. Uh, life sciences, of course, uh, people are developing vaccines and a lot of lab science products and hardware. Then finally, value added, value added manufacturing. There's a lot going on there. Jeff is probably going to speak a lot about that. But I want to circle back and just spend maybe 15 seconds in one area. Outer space and defense. We know commercial space in aviation um, is not doing well right now. But outer space, um, there's a rocket taken off by SpaceX at 12 o'clock, roughly 30 minutes from now, being launched into orbit. They're launching 60 satellites. Satellite technology allows us to communicate and connect around the world. That is big, that is promising. And secondly, and finally, defense. The defense budget has a $686 billion budget. There's a new category called US Space Force. They have a $10 billion budget. They are the military services branch that's gonna train and equip our services to do things in outer space. That is all brand new for our economy. That's going to create some new opportunities for our uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, there's no doubt uh, that space program, a lot of opportunities for manufacturers here in Michigan. Um, that's for sure. That's a whole separate subject. Uh, Mike, you know, uh, Mike is North American Manufacturing Industry Practice Leader at Chubb. 
from an insurance interesting perspective. But where do you see some of the opportunities from your clients and, and some of the risks? Thanks, Tom. Um, well, first of all, Doug, I want to thank you for that. It's hard to follow the guy that's talking about space when I want to talk about insurance. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, thank you for having me here. Um, this is exciting to have a chance, really. I, I did 110 flights last year. Um, certainly will be significantly less than that this year. And uh, the opportunity to get in front of folks and have a, a chat like this is, is always great and represent Chubb and talk about a, assessing risk and how we can help our customers. Um, but where do we see opportunities and in, in some of the evolution is, you know, it's not just all about reshoring, it's also about really the current environment. And what we see in the immediacy of our customers is really nimbleness or adaptation. And that, you know, the ones that have adapted and really just engaged with technology are the ones that have been able to move the quickest and have adapted from perhaps industries that really have been struggling over the past six months into ones such as medical, um, in some cases consumer products that um, really are, are taking off and continuing forward. So within our book, we see customers that frankly are, are going both directions, unfortunately, and those that have adapted and really um, are utilizing technology and using value added services that we are gonna talk about more um, are the ones that are moving forward. New risks come with that and new challenges, but um, Doug, as you mentioned with the Space Force, you know, those, those challenges bring opportunities and we look forward to working with all of you and working with our customers to solve those challenges. Great, Mike, thanks. And Jeff, really excited to have you on, on, on today's panel. Uh, Jeff Simic is, uh, is one of our clients. RCO Engineering provides passionate leadership, team building. Um, you know, he has over 23 years of experience and brings a real strategic view uh, perspective to our panel. Jeff, what do you see as, you know, some of the opportunities uh, in what your RCO is working on and some of the risks? Yeah, thank you, Tom. You know, I think, you know, we've done a lot of talking over the last year or two about the fourth industrial revolution. And I think, you know, that is, to me, I describe that as taking talent, technology, and tools to eliminate work waste and worry. And we know we have a lot of work waste and worry in our in our markets today. But, um, you know, I believe that, um, you know, we're going to be launching technology for the rest of our lives. So we really need to focus on that. There's a backlog in today's technology uh, in terms of getting it launched. You know, so I think the biggest risk we have right now is um, relative to reskilling. And how do we do that? Uh, with industry, education, and government, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, not just, you know, here and there across, the, you know, the, the calendar year. We need to really focus on that. I think that the nation that learns how to launch the technology most efficiently wins, and I think that uh, that's, you know, where we need to, where we need to head. I think if I were to be a little bit more narrow focused about where opportunities are, I think it's, I like to talk about the electric propulsion, land, air, or sea relative to mobility. I think there's a huge drive, uh, certainly for the Midwest, uh, could be uh, you know, a, a huge player in that. And that also gets into the space aspect of you know, what Douglas is talking about. I like what you had to say there, Doug. Great, Jeff, thank you. And I, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to, to, to Thomas Stewart. But again, really, a, a hopefully have an interactive discussion, a lot of strategic ideas. Hopefully you pick up on one. And uh, Thomas, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, it's, it's a world of Toms here and 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 uh, it's all the good and thank you. Um, briefly, I'm Tom Stewart. I'm the executive director of the National Center for the Middle Market uh, at Ohio State. Uh, so virtually crossing that crossing that uh, DMZ to talk to you guys in in Michigan about this and and I'm going to be moderating it or and moderating or as I like to sometimes think of immoderating uh, the the rest of this conversation um, as I was thinking myself about some of these risks and opportunities and I th think we're all finding ourselves in agreement on some main themes, but with a whole lot of different ways of looking at it and exciting ways of looking at it. 
I, I'm thinking of three things. I'm thinking of resilience, first of all, and resilience in the sense that there's a whole lot of stress on organizations right now and the ability to take a licking and keep on ticking is a pretty important both uh, risk and opportunity. Uh, uh, just to be able to stay in the game is going to be an opportunity for some and will be a risk for others. Um, uh, what uh, Mike was talking about, about nimbleness, uh, adaptability, the ability to pivot, uh, and, and that's going to be, I think, a crucial uh, opportunity and a crucial way of seizing the opportunities that are here. And it's going to show up in different ways in different industries. You know, uh, Doug, you were mentioning life sciences, and it's fascinating, for example, to see that telemedicine is dramatically changing the way clinical trials, for example, might be done and all kinds of other things might be done. It was some work that, that we did that, that um, uh, Chubb was involved with. We sort of looked at some of those changes. So this nimbleness, adaptability, versatility, ability, pivot and flexibility. But then, so you survive, you're nimble and adaptable, you're flexible, but then you also need to, to learn and scale. You need to learn from that. Um, from those things that those experiments that you've conducted, those pivots that you've done, that versatility and flexibility, and you need to scale and scaling and skilling, having the skills to 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 scale our issues. So I, I think of when I look at this world, I'm thinking of these three themes of resilience, uh, nimbleness, uh, and and then learning and scaling, is sort of where we might look at opportunities. But but let's begin, guys. Um, uh, by talking about a, a, something that was mentioned, I think, by, by all, all of you briefly, which is there's a clear a lot of conversation, a lot of conversation among policymakers, a lot of conversation in the sort of the business thinking world about the topic of, of reshoring. Um, let's talk about reshoring. How big is the opportunity? Uh, and, and maybe Jeff, you can take the lead here. I mean, when you look at the reshoring uh, opportunities that you're seeing, uh, are they big? Are they important? Are they are they are they game changers? And how how, how do you look at that at, at what people are saying about reshoring? You know, <clears throat> I take like a macro. I like to look at a macro approach. You know, we're, we're a, a, industries A to Z are shaped often by politics, economics, technology, and regulatory trends. And when you look at the politics in today's market, we've got um, you know, buy American, hire American. We've got uh, a pandemic situation going on that um, has increased our awareness of you know the different. Uh, you know, fragments in our in our supply chains, certainly the global supply chain, um, you know, China and, you know, China's the situation there. I think there's a lot of sentiment about, you know, countries overseas uh, back up and running. China's one of them. Um, and I think folks are really starting to look at the idea of, of, you know, do I buy American to pay an American job? And I think that's really growing. Uh, from an economics perspective, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity. There has been opportunity ever since 2010. We started looking at um, bringing uh, products back into the states, uh, primarily in the tooling aspect of things. So making sure that we're buying tooling uh, here locally. I think there's a lot of, you know, from a lead time, from a logistics, from the collaboration of a, the supply chain here locally is much easier to fix issues <laughs> a lot faster. I think the other thing uh, that's driving... And those um, fundamentally change the economics, right? The, the lead time, the logistics, and the fixing changes. It goes from price to total cost, really, changing the economics. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it's the big picture, what total cost of ownership uh, scenario and risk. Um, and certainly, I think the other thing that's happening is the differentiation. There's a huge desire for differentiation in basically every industry. And I believe that uh, that's creating a higher mix, low volume growth. Uh, in terms of, you know, um, we've, we've got higher mixed products to manage and the volumes are not as high. Uh, so we need to be agile and scalable in that scenario, as you talked about, Tom, Thomas. And, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, technology, obviously automation A to Z, uh, front end, back end, uh, robots, you name it, um, are all becoming a lot, they're within reach and easier to to grab, and I think that that's helping us obviously produce products and, uh, you know, data's king relative to intelligence and metrics. Uh, all that stuff is helping us um, keep the keep the products here uh, on shore. 
So is yeah, really, the other side the opportunity? This is not just a buzzword. You see a real opportunity here. Yeah. Right? Doug, you've looked at some industries on some of this, and I actually you mentioned pharma in your earlier list. Uh, as you look around at reshoring, how would you sort of, where do you see the 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 opportunity in that landscape? How big is it? And maybe you can focus us in on a few places where you see it. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, pharma obviously is the obvious one. We uh, we uh, see that our um, bulk of our U.S. Drugs are manufactured using compounds and from China in particular, mm -hmm. and they're compounding a lot of our uh, pharma products. I think uh, in view of the COVID crisis, people are maybe having a feeling they want to have that a little closer to home and uh, have that product made in America, and maybe they can maybe control the quality of those products a little bit more. So I think there's a feeling of wanting to bring back these things that we consume every day, whether it's our statin for our high cholesterol because we eat or whatever it happens to be, there's a, a drive to bring certain products back in the pharma space back home so we can have it labeled made in the good old USA. It's probably gonna cost more to do that. And uh, guys like Jeff who are on the front line of selling and making products are gonna figure out how to charge uh, customers and pass that on on the customers. We know it's it's not cheap to make things necessarily always back here in the US. But um, I, I think in the pharma space, there definitely is an opportunity there. Um, there, there. Uh, I wrote a, a white paper recently on the intellectual property risks associated with reshoring manufacturing. And we can share that with the audience if anybody wants it. We can we can post it in the chat line here. But there, uh, there were 11 different benefits I talked about, and uh, uh, Jeff mentioned uh, a couple of those. There are three I just want to share, if I can, Tom. And that is one: it avoids deliberating effects on tariffs. Right. Sure. So right. Um, yeah. we didn't really talk too much about that in our rehearsal sessions, but. Um, the tariffs can have a, a big effect on guys like Jeff or need to importing products or try to export products in these various countries. So well, there's a the political tariff. risk and uncertainty there. What happens if my tax rate changes basically? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing I just want to point out, having an improved proximity to the US customer base, of course, improves delivery of the new products and we can get them to market faster. So manufacturers like Jeff and their engineering groups can get things to the market faster. So we're closer. Um, we can implement those changes faster when we're designing and making them the products here in our plants in Michigan or Ohio mm -hmm. or in the Midwest, where have you. Um, so we're increasing that uh, ability to uh, put new products in the marketplace faster. Then the final thing I would say, um, of course, the, the big thing I hear with my clients, that is by centralizing the manufacturing back here, we're reducing manufacturing errors, which is a big headache to fix, and we're reducing the lead times as well. So we're shortening that that line up a little bit by doing that. So I don't know if I answered your question specifically, Tom, but I just want to share a couple benefits that I've seen that um, that my clients are talking about. You did, and maybe, I don't know, Mike, you might be able to take this or anybody. One of the things that I'm thinking about also is like, there is this policy environment. There might be a policy environment that says for healthcare, what we have for defense, we want to be able to make these things here for security reasons or, or, or whatever reasons. There's this, the economics changing with the total cost of ownership, maybe for making small batches, you don't need big scale economies as much as, and so on and so forth. It's also a question of who's making these decisions. And it seems to me that many of the beneficiaries of reshoring would be the smaller mid-sized companies, the suppliers to large companies. But many of the decision makers up there might be the big companies, might be the companies who have offshored work in the past and might be needed. How do if you put your on your empathy hat and think from the point of view of, 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 of one of these smaller companies, how do you get the big guys to change their mind? Or maybe looking from the point of view of the bigger companies, how do you get them to say, all right, gee, how do I undo 20 years of offshoring to think about how I'm selectively going to be reshoring. Anybody want to take take that from either point of view? You know, uh, I think you know it's going to be hard to reverse, like you said, the 20 years of globalization. I think that uh, there's a hybrid approach. I I do. Um, I think there's you know companies need to 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 you know the Fortune 100 need to get together and and work on you know, collaborative to make that happen. Um, I know that they're working on collaboratives and we talked a little bit about about minority businesses and, and, and the growth there. Maybe there's a potential um, where that could be um, something where the minority companies could, you know, it's a joint, you know, kill two birds with one stone kind of thing. But, 
I guess that would be my comment. Yeah, so 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 maybe some sort of consortium work among the big companies to think about how do we help build the capability base in our supply, in our domestic supply areas, right? Yeah. And I think it's going to be, some of it's going to be inherent. I mean, if you look at regulation, I mean, aerospace is critical infrastructure. Yeah. Um, you know, aerospace is on a pause right now. The commercial aerospace drives a big chunk of paying all the bills in the, in, uh, the industry. Um, it being on a pause now, there's a, you know, there's a, a silver lining in that pause is that we can realign today. Um, some of those, um, some of those uh, reshoring activities. So I think that there's just in general an inherent uh, path forward as well as, you know, can we collaborate? Uh, and I'm also guessing before, before we leave this topic, which we may, may well come back to, that there's, when you think about the building capacity to do this, you want to build, there, there's like mindset, desire, economics, but then feasibility. And some of that feasibility might also be in helping, and I know we're going to come to the skills question later, but helping those smaller, the supplier kinds of companies understand what capabilities they need, where they can get them, connecting them with resources, whether they be community colleges or other workforce development resources, technology resources to help them be in a position to take advantage of opportunities that, that, that might appear. But it's, yeah, big. you know, Tom, I hear you saying that this is that there, there's a lot of zeitgeist talk about a lot of buzz in the air and the atmosphere, but there really is. This is not one of those things that is just sort of buzzword. There really are bees making that buzz and there could be real honey. Boy, that metaphor is going to die. Uh, there could be real, <laughs> there could be real opportunity, real opportunity in thinking about reshoring. So think about it, right? Scan, think, develop the skills and make the pitch to whoever you need to make the pitch to. Mike, I want to pick up a theme from this though, because one of the things that you mentioned, uh, and that's and and also um, I think uh, Jeff might have mentioned, is that, and, a, and a real opportunity in reshoring is not just the product, but the value added, the value added services, right. the higher value manufactured products as opposed to commodity manufacturing, and also you know, basically moving up the value chain, whether to higher value products or uh, or, or value added services. Um, how do you see the opportunities and risks in this space? How big are they? How do you get at them? How scary are they? <laughs> well, you know, Tom, one of the things just to back up for a second is, um, and this, I don't think this came from you, it was a couple of years ago, but roughly half of the manufacturers out there were using advanced manufacturing techniques, but within five years, it was going to be 90%. And that's yeah. a little bit, you know, so we're three years away from that effectively. <clears throat> and, you know, a part of that is not only just the technology on the factory floor in essence, and what comes with that, but to your point, more and more we are seeing from our customers that instead of just manufacturing the product, they now have that service component that goes with it. Um, whether that is, you know, after the market, that is collection of data uh, and things of that nature, analyzing the data. In some cases, they even sell it. And, um, you know, there there's responsibility that comes with that. And, and you know, again, for the group on the audience here, Tom and, and Chubb have done some work together and Tom's team has done a great job. And one of the things that they have looked at is what happens to a manufacturer as they adapt from merely manufacturing a product to that value added proposition. And there's, there's a couple things. One is uh, the growth rate is faster. Uh, that group significantly outperforms those that are merely selling the product. The other part that comes with that is that effectively there's a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, whether that be collection of data, um, you know, connectivity with the customer or supplier or probably both. And what are you doing with that data? Uh, how are you protecting it? And then the third part that comes along with that, you know, in addition to what normally is thought of and I just mentioned, which is really the cyber exposure from the big bad guy, uh, is the financial loss that can also come with that in interacting with the customer on a value added uh, proposition. So that, that very well may not be a cyber type exposure, but more of an errors and emissions exposure 
based on uh, not delivering what was promised, not delivering to the extent that was promised, uh, misstatements and things like that, that never would have come up had the product merely just been sold and the um, entity just walked away from it. So you know, I guess to answer your, your general question, Tom, you know, what we see again back to nimbleness is that the customers of ours that have adapted to go beyond just selling the product and are interacting with their customers to a greater degree for a longer time frame are growing significantly faster than those that, that do not. So when I think about this, and the, the whole business of value added services, and, and Mike, maybe you can expand on this a little bit. I think there's one yeah. thing, like the first thing is, well, I'll sell not only the widget, but I'll also sell maintenance. I'll come and I'll, I'll sell, the, I'll sell right. the sales and service, right? And so right. I will have a service component. Um, and that seems to be the sort of low hanging fruit of value added services. But right. you get to a much more integrated sort of thing where I'm selling, if you'll forgive the buzzword, I'm selling not just the product, but the solution. And that mm -hmm. has a whole lot uh, uh, more opportunity. It tends to be, by the way, reshored because it's going to be closer to the customer, which which connects <laughs> our, our themes here. But but it also requires it would require me as the seller, as the manufacturer, to get uh, to develop a, a whole bunch of different capabilities and mindsets beyond sort of the design and production of products. I have to. I have, to, I have to build skills in a whole bunch of other areas if I'm really going to seize this opportunity. Is, is that fair to say? Absolutely. You know, and it's funny, no matter what we're talking about here, um, for the four of us on the screen, one of the things that's a challenge these days is just people. And you talk about the skill set, and we see it in our customers. Um, you know, the first thing is you may walk in someplace and there are fewer people, but they're higher skilled. And that's a challenge right there that it may improve the risk, but uh, it's a challenge finding those people. It's a challenge, as you mentioned, Tom, earlier, tra training those people. And, you know, to carry it to the next step, uh, you know, Tom, you talk about maintenance, but we now have software that is, you know, included in many, many products. And mm -hmm. that software continues to obviously operate once it goes out the factory floor. And it is oftentimes connected. So we bring that word back in. And, you know, in, so in addition to, you know, does the machine work or not, you know, we have to worry about things now with that software that you have to continue to, to operate and, and update. Is, is it pop properly protected or can the bad guy access through a portal or a weakness in your software into their systems now and all of a sudden you potentially have created a financial injury that you never had to worry about before when there wasn't this issue of connectivity and, and that, that that all comes into that value-added service and doug that is a fastball right in the middle of your plate yeah Go thank on. you guys <laughs> i didn't ask for it i'm salivating well, this, this but that's the point i mean that's that's the point these things do connect and when, when we've got we, we've got some, the right set of combination to think about these things. Yeah. So just yesterday, I had a, a conversation with a private equity firm who's looking to buy a company who has in place their manufacturing operations, they're selling the replacement parts, they have the low hang of fruit of the servicing, the machines, all that stuff. And guess what? what what's the next low hanging fruit? Is uh, developing the e-commerce channel so that all those products and services can be run through what this thing right here, Again, what, what was one of the things I said that's hot right now? Not software. software and platforms, yep. All my IT guys are, can't sleep at night. They have so much work to do. So here's what's going on. And this can be done on also any old fashioned manufacturing enterprise across uh, the United States. And that is the traditional brick and mortar is selling stuff used to be by picking up the phone and they take 70% of their orders by the phone or somebody fax it in. Well, who has a fax anymore, right? But guess what? The next generation of people happen to be younger than us on this on this call here today. They're probably 30, 40 year old uh, engineers who are maybe working in the plant, designing products and services or ordering the replacement parts. Guess what they wanna do? They wanna hop on their phone, plug into the website of XYZ supplier and uh, order the part while they're walking through the plant. They have the, the company credit card plugged in. And by the time he or she gets back to his engineering desk, 
or CAD tube or whatever they're using, they actually have placed an order already for the replacement part because somebody decided to make it easy to buy on the phone. That's happening all day long. And that is a hot spot right now in innovation. And, and let's go a little bit beyond just easy to buy on the phone, but thinking about the value added service of being easy to do business with. And I, I think, you know, broadly, and obviously technology platforms and integration do a whole lot of that. Jeff, you've been you've been working this street actually in real in in in, in the real world. Um and can you talk about what you've been doing and maybe a, a story or two about how you've worked in the value added services and the higher value manufacturing, starting from a, a I mean you actually you started as a job shop for for like innovative bench scale kind of manufacturing. But can you talk about this whole value added, high value man, uh, opportunity? Yeah, no, absolutely. RCO has got a great story here. You know, like you said, job shop, product development partner. Um, we not only took on value added uh, services, but we took on uh, our products as well. Um, we took it on in aerospace under highly regulated uh, environment, you know, so we're basically the Maytag of, you know, passenger seating for business jets, and you know we have spares around the world, and and had to develop a repair station, and you know it, you know I will tell you that um, it as Mike was speaking, uh, it's yes, it adds to your revenue stream. It takes time, um, you know, you can't. I wouldn't shy away from uh, the value add aspect of things, but you also have to recognize that the you know, you, this is a disruption to your resources, your processes, your values that you need to focus on. And you're probably going to need a heavyweight team uh, to push yourself uh, through this aspect of, of your new offering. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's sort of my macro statement on the subject matter. I and mean, we get, there's lots of details that we've learned, um, you know, if an aircraft uh, gets your product in it and next thing you know, you discover an issue and, those things are flying around the world. It become a glo It's a global environment too. So it's not just. Uh, it's not just the fact that you know we we went from job shop to aerospace uh, OEM, but you know you also got to think about the diversification of where the products landing out in the market, and uh, it's global too. So um, I can, I don't I can't think of a bigger uh, accomplishment for RCO. Uh, and and success with all of this, it just took a lot of passion to get through it all and just continue to learn and learn and learn and and, and develop a network out there in this new industry and, or this new offering that you have. You know, I'm just thinking about a conversation I had many years ago and mindful of the fact that we are brought to you here by a an accounting and advisor, accounting tax, and as well as an advisory firm with UHY. Many years ago, uh, when I was at... Uh, HBR, I was talking to Sam Palmasano uh, about IBM and IBM's expansion from manufacturing into services and consulting and so on and so forth. And one of the things he said to me is, you know, that, 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 that this sort of evolution is even as a, it even causes challenges when you start thinking about how you pay people bonuses and how you decide whether performance is good. Because in a, in a manufacturing environment, return on assets is a really important metric. But in a services environment, return on assets is your assets are desks, desks and computers. And, and so return on assets is a very different metric. And you really want to think about return on sales or other ways of measuring success. And, and so there, there's a you know, everything that we've talked about also comes also to this sort of strategic mindset about if you're thinking about yourself moving in this direction, you are, you really are rethinking your organization from bookkeeping, from the factory floor to bookkeeping and, 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 and everything, everything in between, as well as, you know, the risk management issues, Doug, that you and Mike have both talked about, because you really create a whole new set of, you know, exposures to things that can go wrong. I, um, I can I can speak to that if you want to talk about risks with things. Sure, like sure. Let's talk for just a second. Then I want to talk about innovation too, because that's going to take us that that'll take us down to another good street. But yes, let's talk risk. So, so we're talking about risks. So as a patent attorney that tries cases, both patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, 
we're on the, the receiving side of uh, uh, patent lawsuits or what, what have you, and it could be in the district court or in a patent office. So just a little tidbit here. In the third quarter of 2020, patent infringement suits in the United States were up 23% for a total of 1,009 new lawsuits. So the, these patent suits, which you know, patent is a monopoly to exclude others from making, using, selling, and offering for sale the patent invention for 20 years. So my point is, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, um, you need to think about if you're reshoring uh, products and machines and, and processes back to the United States, you could be subjecting your company to potential liability for not kind of clearing the deck on doing the due diligence on that new machine or widget to make sure you're not infringing somebody else's uh, patent. Okay, and just another tidbit on risk. Um, there's a method in the patent office that we use to challenge the validity of a patent. Those disputes are called IPRs. Those disputes in the patent office, third quarter, are up 36% compared to last year. So my point is, patent disputes are up. People yeah. are spending money, um, and, and there are now private equity firms that fund litigation, which is a source of some of these new lawsuits. So um, uh, be that as it may, I just want to point out to the audience, even reshoring and, and launching these new products, you need to make sure you're doing your due diligence to make sure you're not stepping into a sand trap by infringing somebody else's uh, intellectual property uh, yeah. item. You, you know, I cut my teeth talking about intellectual capital, which intellectual property is a piece, <laughs> and 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 this and that. But of course, so is human capital and various other things that are not tacit knowledge, that are processes, know-how that are not written down. But but that's there. And Mike, you also were talking about you move into this area space of advanced manufacturing and value-added services. You open yourself up to the protection of your data, the safety of your product, all kinds of more cyber exposures so there's different right. kind of, of risk there but let's go back this is risks and opportunities we see enormous opportunities to move up the value added scale bring things home get closer to your customers but also you got to make sure that you're protecting yourself and mike did i summarize that site that's uh the, the security issues well or do you want to expand to that no you did but can i add one thing real quick on, on what doug was talking about and, and I chuckle about this because a lot of times and we do this internally. We talk about, I guess I'll call it the sexy things and the financial oriented. And there's a whole other spectrum here that's involved in the term of reshoring. And that is where do you reshore to? And, um, you know, so if you think about non-sexy, I guess, which is plant and equipment, um, you know, we're having a discussion about reshoring back to the U.S., but not everything's coming back here. And certainly, you know, if you're coming from Asia, you, you could end up in Mexico or someplace like that. That brings different risks than what Asia brought and certainly different risks than what is in the United States. And uh, I think it's, it's important to recognize that as well, um, that certainly things coming back to the U.S. from our perspective are preferable, but that's not always where they go. And uh, yeah. some of these other parts of the world are challenging as well. But yeah, yeah it, it's interesting, Tom. Um, from a cyber perspective, if you look at 2019, uh, manufacturing really became kind of a little bit of the epicenter, if you want to put it that way. And I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but from a dollar standpoint, uh, manufacturing represented over half of the uh, ransomware claims. But I, I believe the number of claims was something like 20% of the overall. So uh, two things that come out of that. Number one is manufacturing is not immune. Um, and it may not be that you see physical damage. It may be the bad guy just getting in there and slowing you down or shutting you down. And then the other one is that oftentimes there's a feeling of, well, I'm not big, so they won't come after me. And we found in 2019 that that is not true. Um, yep. That, you know, they've gone down, in essence, the size chain, if you will. And, uh, you know, smaller manufacturers are getting hit with the ransomware claims as well. And therefore, protection of, of the systems, in essence, uh, becomes critical, uh, you know, whether you're, you're 5, 10 million in sales or you're, you know, 5 billion in sales. Yeah. So, yeah. Doug, I saw a hand go up there. Yeah. And just to follow that up on Mike's point, the Internet of Things, which is a big growth area, which I could put onto my bucket of opportunities in the U.S., manufacturers are embracing that with wide open arms which just means your, your network is opened up to different nodes throughout your plant, 
the satellites in the universe and your phone, right? So yeah. my point is, I think you're going to have an increased exposure on the cyber issues, Mike, because manufacturers mm -hmm. want to be connected to the cloud and to various networks. And so, well, and the products themselves are hackable. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really very interesting. This kind of gets, and I'm glad you mentioned the Internet of Things because it gets into, you know, Jeff, you were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and that does include smart connected devices, includes sort of more of an integration of manufacturing and services. It includes a whole lot of other, other things, but it also includes a whole lot of, I guess, need to think about your innovation capability. Uh, and, 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 and you've been, you know, this, this is, this is RCO's bread and butter, but if you could talk about as you know, lessons that you've learned about how to, um, innovate, I don't know whether you're innovating faster, innovating smarter, innovating more, I don't know, innovating better. And, and what, what are those elements of, of superior innovation that you think companies really right now have an opportunity to seize? Well, I, you know, I think that um, when it comes to the the fourth industrial revolution, obviously it's a big basket of things that that, that we can use that, that that help with innovation. And um, I think the the number one thing is is really to try to get as number of use cases as you can in your your operation. Um, you know, so and that's across all areas. It could be your you know your ERP system, as simple as that. But that's a huge item. Um, it can be uh, things in uh, manufacturing execution systems on your floor, um, it, you know, your, your product lifecycle management, upgrading that to the latest and greatest technologies uh, so that you can, um, you know, that obviously helps you from a speed to market perspective and not making errors and things of that nature. And errors obviously drive and impede uh, market uh, penetration. You know, I think, um, but the, getting the num the most number of use cases, and you know, additive manufacturing. RCO made a big investment in additive a uh, number of years ago, and that has brought us, uh, it has enabled us to bring innovation and ideas to market so much faster. And you know, additive is not as sexy as it used to be, but it's still there, and it's it's kind of commonplace now. You know, because we bring the the product overnight. Um, and, you know, it's been a huge uh, catalyst, uh, even lately, you know, uh, prior to COVID-19, we brought in, uh, you know, it helped us with, faith, you know, uh, building PPE and inventing new uh, products in the PPE market, uh, whether it be a reusable N95 mask or it's something as simple as a face shield. And then we converted it over to, you know, standard traditional uh, molding practices. Um, and so, I mean, that all happened within days instead of weeks relative to, to bringing things to market. So there's, you know, uh, you know, we're augmented reality and, and doing ideation sessions um, and, you know, the digital and uh, physical worlds being brought together so that we can analyze uh, products uh, faster. I mean, all of that stuff. It, I'm an operations guy and not the design guy, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I watch that stuff happening inside the company. And all of those are all just use cases uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. And you need to grow them. You need not to be scared. You need to go after it. And I'm telling you, it will make a difference in your operation, whether you learn something new and throw it away, but, you know, at least you crossed it off the list and you went down the road for the next item. So I, what I hear you saying is that if you think about the stages of innovation from ideation through design, right? So you've got ideation, uh, prototype, scaling design, uh, uh, or design and production. You, what, 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 I, what I hear you saying is that there are sort of innovation technologies, some of which you know Mike and Doug have already talked about, that can help all of those be, be both faster on the one hand, fa faster and less expensive, right? Uh, so I can I, I can prototype less expensively and I can prototype more uh, more quickly, but also with augmented reality and ideation and more use cases, I can also be broader. I so I can I can I can see see I can get more opportunities, see more opportunities quicker, and then get to the stage where I can test those opportunities faster and cheaper. If I sort of systematically look at rethink my innovation capability, did I, is that is that kind of what 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 you're thinking? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, with our CO, we're, we're definitely a, a special case because we're horizontally integrated across, and I'm not trying to do a sales pitch here, but I just from a, a perspective of, you know, what types of things help, um, you know, the horizontal integration, I mean, we, we have a broad set of manufacturing capabilities that are basically um, within very close reach to each other, uh, sister facilities and, and focused factories that you know that that makes scalability and flexibility once you you've landed on that design and and you've got something you want to bring to market then that's the other strength that i think is important is either a a collaboration to create horizontal integration with other companies and or build more of it into your 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 operation so let's go let's open we've got 15 to 14 minutes left uh, and we could talk about these risks and opportunities forever. Uh, but let's let's go to the one that is that should never be an afterthought, and we could have started with it, which is the people piece of this. Um, you know, I, I remember the, the last time I took the drive from this was pre-COVID, uh, from Columbus up to uh to uh Detroit, I guess I was passing billboards saying you know, drivers want it. I mean, you know, the, the skills gap and with a full employment environment, we had lots of skills issues. Uh, I know we've documented the sort of a, a large digital skills gap, but there's also a large classic manufacturing, I took shop in high school skills gap. Um, and, 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 you know, so, so we have transformation. We also, we have, we have, uh, you know, service, servitization. Uh, how do you look at the talent challenge, uh, which is, again, both a risk or an obstacle and, and an opportunity. Um, I don't know who would like to, to, to grab that people net, nettle first. Doug, go ahead. I'm going to answer a little bit differently than what maybe Mike or Jeff might, and that is I'm going to approach this from the standpoint, the people challenge is being uh, actually solved by some of the technology opportunities out there. And I'm going to give you one, one opportunity I heard in Squawk Box. I'm a Squawk Box geek. So Shopify, Shopify is an online uh, service where people sell their wares. It's a great uh, digital warehouse for going and selling products. Shopify has teamed up with John Bright and Hope to form an operation called Operation Hope. They have a goal to create 1 million new African-American businesses in 10 years. How's that for a platform? Pretty and the platform. CEO of Shopify is very passionate about this. So they're going to create a lot of job opportunities and a lot, for a lot of individuals and their families, we didn't really talk about this. This is your kind of non-traditional way opportunities are being created. So people are taking their own skill set, Tom, and building a product. And but guess what? The internet has created a pipeline called Shopify, and there are lots of different pipelines for dispersing products, Amazon or whatever. But this new age we're in of digital transformation allows me to create a product, I could maybe have a, a, a small uh, production line in my garage. I can now ha I now have a prop pipeline to sell it via Shopify, and I don't need to have brick and mortar. I think that digital transformation we're seeing are going to create new opportunities for people to have maybe skills on a very limited subset to make a widget or a service. Um, and we now have a pipeline for a whole new part of our gig economy. You know, 20 years ago, Paul Sappho, then at the Institute of the Future, said to me that he thought that the Internet was a full employment act for entrepreneurs. And and that may be a, a, an example. Of that. Mike, there's something else when you think about this, about access to, to talent and skills. Obviously, there's developing your own, there's hiring, but there also are kinds of arrangements that you can make. There are alliances and joint ventures and partnerships and reshoring. And as you look around at what your clients are doing, how do you see the skills opportunity? And Jeff, I'm going to leave this monkey on your back when we come to the end of this. Yeah. Program. But Mike, why do you see? You, you were perfect, Tom, because I was thinking, let's leave Jeff for the end here because Jeff is at the epicenter of this and firsthand. And and I, I certainly see it for you know our customers and assessing risk and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, Tom, you know, on one hand, uh, it's the comments been made, you know, higher skilled. And from our perspective, that higher skilled employee presents a better risk to us. Um, you know, they may be operating, you know, the keyboard and the computer more than anything. So that alleviates some of the concerns that we've had in the past, whether it's lifting and things like that, that maybe just don't occur anymore. Uh, Doug, you made you kind of headed down the path of you know talking about a little bit about automated warehouses and things like that. You know, 
uh, we see those as well. You know, you've got the robots running around the warehouses now instead of workers. Um, that certainly, you know, presents the opportunity or not opportunity, the challenge because it has displaced people, but it also creates a different type of risk um, that, uh, you know, changes the whole dynamic from how we look at these things. And then the other part of that, though, is there are still things that cannot or at, at this point are not replaced. Um, or are not automated. And Tom, your your comment there um, about the billboard and, and looking for people, you know, even again, to get away from the sexiness, you know, truck drivers, uh, a lot of manufacturers have fleets of trucks and it is a challenge finding truck drivers. And as much as the future may bring changes there, um, and I live about 15 miles from the Tesla factory, so I see that all the time, much to my chagrin, because I don't own one, but, you know, those things are headed, but those are all challenges. Um, and, and Tom, to really answer your question there, uh, within our customer base, I really haven't seen much that I can think of that, you know, joint ventures came together, alliances came together and things like that to really, um, you know, in that, that individual customer address the, the staffing mm -hmm. issue, if you will. It's been more one-on-one -on -one and the challenges that they're faced with. And Jeff, when you look at your talent pipeline or your talent needs, uh, or expand to think about, you know, Michigan or the Midwest and what you see with the opportunities we've talked about, about reshoring and about higher value added manufacturing, more innovation. How, how does that, does that, how does talent figure into there as opportunity or obstacle? You know, <clears throat> I think there's a war on, we're in a war for talent. In both the nation and globally, you know, to bring um, technologies to market. I, um, you know, at one point in time, I mean, we won the war for talent back when we can do it with Rosie the Riveter behind me back in 1945. But, you know, uh, when, Detroit, when Detroit saved the world. But, um, you know, I, you know, we uh, focus on, you know, training our own talent. I, we can't let anyone else, uh, we can't wait for anyone else. Um, to do it. So we do, uh, you know, apprenticeships and, um, you know, probably where we might be the weaker or weakest at it right now is, is you know, how do you train folks where you, you were inside a new technology that you might not understand? Um, and I, I think that's where we need help from, um, you know, 365 days a year, you know, 24 seven, like I talked to, or opened up with, um, where we're talking about this every day. Uh, as uh, an alliance amongst government, industry, and education, and a real a purposeful alliance to drive this thing. Um, because, um, um, well, I, we need it. You know, we need talent, yeah. um, and uh, we have to keep moving forward. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, in this alliance, you talked about it between industry, government, and, edu and, and, and uh, education is one that, I know some work that we've done with the Brookings Institute about that. It's it's very you find some places where that works really well, uh, but they tend to be places. You know, I mean, there are parts of Kentucky where that works really well. There are various other parts where, we're, but but you don't necessarily you can't necessarily say broadly across the country or even across the state. You can't you can't really say, well, these guys really have this alliance set up right. Um, I see Tom coming on, and I think he's going to see if we've got a couple of questions that we want to manage uh, in the in the minutes in the minutes uh, that we've got left. So uh, uh, we can open that up. Tom, do you have some for us? I, are you coming back in? Sorry. Uh, yes, we do have a, a few questions. Uh, one is uh, Jeff mentioned that factory automation is a uh, as a trend. I know this is happening in a big way for large industrial manufacturers but you know what about smaller uh middle market companies are we seeing them embrace automation or is it still not cost effective for them i think the um it's becoming very cost effective for the middle market you have to uh and and even for small companies in my mind um you know some of these software platforms and and uh you know data center or not data centers but uh, iot devices and and um you know, it, it's a part of, uh, you really need to plant a seed and get a catalyst going on your floor because, you know, ultimately what you want is your supervisor to, to design his own app, to run his own business, you know, and have the ability to do that. 
Um, and once they begin to start feeling and uh, holding that in their hands, they be, uh, you know, it, it creates a whole new excitement um, in thinking rather than, you know, getting them involved. Um, and there are some new, you know, softwares out there that, uh, that allow for that uh, to some extent. Obviously, you got to be careful that, you know, something you can get in and program yourself and things of that nature are, are probably important. Um, but it's definitely getting cheap, getting less expensive. Um, another question, uh, would the, uh, it's for Douglas, uh, would the space initiatives be a risk with a Biden administration, given that his party doesn't appear to have much appetite in the space, in this space? Well, I think that's a, a subject for, uh, whether Congress is going to continue funding it. You know, the, the space program, uh, was, um, it's a new, as of 2019, uh, uh, the U.S. Space Force is new as, as of 2019. They have a, a $10 billion budget this year. And I would say as long as Congress keeps funding it, that's the answer to the question. So whether Biden is for it against, I really couldn't speak to that. I don't know his policy on that issue. He may or not like it because it was come up and it was developed by President Trump. Um, who knows where that's going to fall out. But there certainly is a need for it. And one quick tidbit. A few years ago, one of my aerospace clients developed technology, and this is patented, I can talk about it, where they use the gas turbine engines to create uh, high frequency energy to then be able to shoot beams down at objects. Does that sound like Star Wars? Ladies and gentlemen, that is here today. And that technology like that is in place right now, and that's really what the, uh, the US Space Force is gonna be about, using that technology and taking it beyond. Cool. If I could add to that, you know, the commercialization of space too, Douglas, um, is running alongside parallel. And there's so much demand for, you know, satellite uh, technology in low Earth orbit um, in terms of, you know, 5G networks and just, you know, just a whole new space infrastructure. Um, probably not in our lifetimes, but, you know, we talked today about a global society. It will definitely be a planetary society one day. But um, I do think commercial, privately funded commercial uh, aerospace is strong, and it, and it is still critical infrastructure, um, even though it's not potentially um, led by you know defense. Yeah. Well, in the in the last 60 minutes of this conversation, Hawthorne, uh, who runs SpaceX, just launched 60 satellites into space. Wow. Just wow. putting things in perspective. Tom, we yeah, got there's two a lot of opportunity in there. That's time, for sure. We have time for one more question, Tom, or we should have we? Got time for one ahead? more. One more. Um, uh, reshoring. Uh, does this really happen under a Biden win? Uh, yeah. As he is expected to lift the tariffs. Oh no, I I can actually talk to that because I I know a couple of people who are academics who are. There, this is this goes with this goes with everybody. I mean, the the tariff structure is may not is one incentive to bring things home, but there are lots of other incentives. And that I think that that's a, a bipartisan question. If you take away the tariff tool, that probably is a, you know, that the, the tariff tool hasn't caused a lot of reshoring in and of itself, but these other things, strategic imperatives, uh, safety and security imperatives, supply chain imperatives. And there are, there, I know that there is a, ta a, a Biden task force on reshoring, uh, it might push, different buttons from a Trump task force on reshoring, but that's that's not going away. Well, that's good. And it's gonna create a lot of opportunities. Obviously, uh, we hope so. Uh, we've kind of been down this path and a lot of hope for reshoring and uh, never materialized. Uh, um, hopefully uh, this time around, we will you know, get some uh, real, real opportunities to stick. So again, I wanna thank our panel uh, for joining us today um, in a high level kind of strategic overview of a lot of different topics. Thank you. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. And again, we have our part three uh, this Friday uh, discussing supply chain. So really exciting topic, a lot, lot going on there. Uh, so it should be really uh, great uh, to join that one also. Again, uh, thank you. And we look forward to our contact information for our team is up on the screen. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Again, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, thank you.